Hallelujah. Shall all of us raise our hands and say Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Somehow, our teachers, uh, 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 parish priests, preachers, our parents have frightened us. Speaking of God. God waiting to punish you. If you do that, he will push you into hellfire. We are frightened. When you commit a sin, he hates you. Don't go to church if you commit a sin. How can he do that? People frightened us. There's a fear. From fear comes anger and irritation. There is irritation in our hearts against God. Check your hearts. Deep into your hearts. Check your hearts. Because we imagine a God is a God waiting to punish us. And we know we fall into sin again and again. As someone told me, I don't go to church every Sunday. But once in a while I go there. Out of obligation. To fulfill the Sunday obligation. Sunday obligation. What an atrocious word. To go to God is an obligation. Obligation means a thing I don't like, but I have to do it. For some reason. The pastor says, what do we think of God? One thing is definite. John 3.16 It's not a punishing God whom Jesus came to reveal to us. Jesus came to reveal to us a God who loved us so much that he sent his only son. Only son. Where St. John says, love us so much. Love the world so much. You must write your name in your Bible. Whatever your name is. My God loved me so much that he sent his only son to die. For what? That I may have eternal life. And Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and life in the full. The fullness of life is what God is offering us. Not the stifling of life. Not punishment. Not curses. It is the fullness of life that God is offering us. That is the gospel. Good news. Somehow, the good news doesn't attract us. We are drawn to bad news all the time. And that's where the papers always publish bad news. Somehow there is in our heart a tendency to be attracted to the bad news. But the good news of the gospel is clear. It's not a punishing God. It's not a cursing God. It's not an indifferent God whom Jesus came to reveal to us. He came to reveal to us a God who loves us so much. That he sent his only son to die for me. I used to wonder, my dear sisters and brothers, therefore, whom does the father love more? Me or Jesus? The heavenly father, whom does he love more? Whom does he care more? For me or for Jesus? If he abandoned Jesus to the cross, that I may live forever, that my sins may be forgiven whom does the Heavenly Father love more? Maybe that question is not right. But in my misery, in my misery of sinfulness, in my misery of sickness, in the misery of my marriage, God the Father thought the only way to save me is to abandon His own Son to the cross. And St. Paul said, Romans 8, 32. Romans 8, 32. If God did not spare even His own Son, when it came to our salvation, will this God deny anything to us? Will this God deny anything to us? Romans 8, 32. My dear sisters and brothers, you know, um, when we open the Bible, even the first pages of the Bible, we begin to misunderstand God. We begin to misunderstand the nature of God. There we are told God gave a command. Not to eat of that fruit. And the devil came. 
the devil came and put doubt sowed the seed of doubt in the mind of the woman and man the devil asked eve why don't you eat of that fruit he said no 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 we are not allowed and the devil the old serpent laughed aloud god has forbidden you to eat of that fruit right and yet you 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 imagine this god loves you oh woman be prudent be wise this god does not like love you this god is afraid of you this god is jealous of you this god knows if you eat of that fruit he will become like him like god he does not want you to be like him that's why he has forbidden the fruit the old serpent managed to put doubt in the mind of eve and adam the brother persists the old serpent has managed to do this to you and to me in the moments of trouble in the moments of sickness in the moments of disasters happening to us the devil walks in creeps in the old serpent to tell us no this god does not love you if god does does love you why does he do this to you why does god do this to you god does not love you and that's why my dear brothers and sisters in matthew chapter 16 matthew chapter 16 when jesus spoke of his own passion and death peter took him by the hand and told him god forbid let this not happen to you let this not happen to you and that's when jesus said satan get behind me jesus calling simon peter satan you know why that was a moment when simon peter was frightened puzzled disturbed and distressed thinking of what is going to happen to jesus his master he loved and that's when satan crept in and that's why jesus said get behind me satan it was it was the command given to the old serpent old serpent creeping into the heart of simon peter my dear sisters and brothers let's know this every time every time you committed a sin every time a disaster fell upon your family every time you lost your job every time there was a financial crisis this old serpent crept in this old serpent crept in to tell you no 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 if god loves you if god loves you why does this happen to you he managed to distract us he succeeded to make us doubt in god's love and that's when from somewhere we got the idea it's the god who does not care it's the god who punishes it's the god who keeps us away from him like the little child we also said i don't like this god i don't like this god because this god does not like me but what really happened in paradise you know uh, adam adam and eve committed sin turned away from god and god came as usual calling adam that voice of god was a threat a lightning falling upon him splitting him apart a threat here is god coming to punish adam began to run away hide himself and god ran after him and asked him adam where are you i'm come in search of you adam said i'm hiding i'm hiding i don't want to come to your presence i don't want you to come into my heart into my life because i'm naked my dear brothers and sisters what's the big thing about being naked 
Adam was always naked, wasn't he? Even before sin, he was naked. What is nakedness? In the Bible, nakedness is not physical lack of clothes. In the Bible, nakedness is an attitude of the heart. Emptiness. Nothingness. I'm empty. I'm useless. I'm good for nothing. I can't stand before you, O oh God. I lost my standing with you. I lost my self-esteem. I lost my self-respect. I despise myself. That's what nakedness is. Despising oneself. Self-contempt. And that's where sin leads us to. Our self-contempt. Oh God, I'm hiding. Because I'm, I'm nothing. I despise myself. I condemn myself. And, and there's a question that God asked. Adam, who told you you are naked? Who told you you have no standing with me? Who told you I hate you? Who told you you lost your standing, your status, your respect with me? And God is saying it, calling Adam by name. And sisters and brothers, in the Bible, call someone by name means call that person with respect and love. That is what it means to call someone by name. Adam, who told you you are naked? I did not tell you, did I? A question the Lord is asking every one of us. There could be one or the other who feels empty, who feels rejected by God, who feels he or she has no standing with God. Someone told me, Father, you pray for me. I told him, sure, I'll pray for you. I asked him, why don't you pray to God? He said, no, Father, there's no use of me praying. God will not answer me. Father, you are close to God, aren't you? You pray to God at the back of our mind. There's a feeling God is partial to those who are virtuous. God does good to those who do good. God does good to those who are praying, those who are virtuous. God loves the good. God hates the bad. At the back of our mind, wrong. Wrong. This could be the teaching of many religions and ideologies. Christianity is different. We have a God who said, I go after the lost sheep. Leaving the 99 in the desert. I go after the lost sheep. Leaving the 99. The 99 who are faithful, who are loyal to the shepherd all the time, listening to the voice of the shepherd, all the time loving the nearness of the shepherd. They are left behind. And the good shepherd goes in search of the lost, of the abandoned. And that is what I am. So, my dear brothers and sisters, whom does God love more? The good or the bad? The sad or the rejoicing? The one who failed or the one who succeeded? The one who failed is lonely. The one who committed a sin is lonely. The one with a family problem is lonely. Abandoned, who feels lost, to them our God goes. Good shepherd. Someone told me, Ah, Father, no wonder Jesus has no followers. Because it's wrong management. Wrong management. What is management? Management is pragmatic. You cater to the good, to the loyal, to the faithful. And forget those who betray you. Forget those who betray you. Forget those who don't care for them. That's leadership, management. Jesus is a poor management expert, isn't he? But that's what Jesus is. In the leadership of a leader who cares only for the faithful, 
only for the loyal followers you and i we have no chance am i right am i right if jesus were a leader who cares only for those who are faithful to him you and i we have no chance with that god because we know how ungrateful we are we know how unfaithful we are we know how broken we are we rejected him we rebelled against him but we have chance with him we chance with him because he he is there for me in the moment of my brokenness in the moment of my sinfulness he is there for me that is his nature love compassion hallelujah till all of us raise our hands and say hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. thank you jesus praise you jesus you know um the story is told of a boy another boy this boy came to know that he failed in the exam and the first thought that came to my his mind was how am i to tell this to my dad surely my dad will be sad then he will be angry then he will hate me then he will beat me i will be rejected this was the pain that came to his heart the whole day he began to evolve a strategy how to present the sad bad truth to his dad so in the evening when the dad came this boy went to his dad with a very broad smile oh dad how are you today oh my son i am very good how are you you know dad the results are come Oh my boy good how did you do the boy said oh what to tell you dad that boy who always used to get the first rank in the class you know dad he he failed that girl our cousin oh she studies all the time and the teacher says she is the best student she also failed and dad that that son of the teacher teacher in you know, our teacher and the teacher is all the time after him to study and he was studying all the time he also failed i also failed i failed is a bad sad truth i'm trying to uh, present it with a sugar coating because i am scared the boy was scared that the boy would be rejected the dad told him my boy i knew it in the morning itself that he failed and the whole day i was thinking how to help you to fare well in your exam i'm thinking of finding a better school for you don't worry my boy and the dad held the boy close to him hallelujah hallelujah shall we say this is what god is and this is what we are a boy trying to hide and we were hiding it's a beautiful book written by john powell a priest psychologist john powell and um the name of the book is why i am afraid to tell you what i am why i am afraid to tell you what i am in the book john powell describes all of us have a pain a a pain of a scare of being rejected to be rejected is the unbearable pain and therefore when when anything goes wrong with us first we are sad then we pretend then we pretend and in the heart of hearts all of us have a feeling i'm not acceptable i'm not acceptable to my god i'm not good enough for my god i'm not good enough for my husband i'm not good enough for my wife 
I'm not good enough for my children. I'm not good enough to teach in the class. I'm not good enough. I'm not okay. I'm not okay. This sad feeling is always there. And therefore the scare. If they come to know, if God comes to know what I really am, I would be rejected. And therefore I reject God. Or I try to put up a makeup. A makeup. You know, this pain is there deep in our hearts. It is this pain of the scare of being rejected that is exploited by multinational companies. Multinational companies. And that's how our television stations thrive. Television channels thrive. Who feeds the television channels? The multinational companies making things, making things that are of no good to us. And yet, they convince us their commodities are necessary for you and for me to be acceptable, to be honorable. And they will tell you, television ads, they're all telling you and me, you're of no good. He was thinking, to be good, to be accepted, to be loved. But to use all these, we put it on, our makeup, our foundation, then um, powder, powder, then lipstick, then red color, then ash color, then yellow color, and you come out like a little demon. Everybody is telling you, you're of no good. And you know that you're of no good. Only God is telling you, you are good enough for me. I'm waiting to enter into your heart. I'm waiting to enter into your life. I'm waiting to enter and make you great. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Whatever your color is, whatever your stature is, there are many people who are very sad because they are very tall. There are many people who are very upset because they are too short. There are many people who are feeling very unacceptable because they are black. But I went to Germany, the people there said, Father, your color is so good, we are too white. Now what's good color? Black or white or brown? There's only one person, only one love, who loves me as I am, whether I'm black or white or dark or, or brown, whether I'm tall or small, even when I commit a sin, there's only one love that you will continue to love me without judging me, without condemning me, that's my God. This God is saying to everyone who accepted Him, He gave the power to be the children of God. And this is the good news the Lord is offering us today. We are precious to Him. We are dear to Him. Isaiah 43, 4 You are precious to me. You are dear to me. I love you. A God waiting for us. How, how, however unacceptable we are. However unloved we think we are, however lost we think we are, however battered we imagine we are, however good for nothing you and I think that we are, this God is telling me, you are good enough for me. If I'm good enough for God, I must really be good. You did not choose me, Jesus said, I chose you. If I'm good enough to be chosen by God, to be His child, I must really be good. Not because there's nothing bad. Yes, there are things bad. There are things wrong. There are things mad in my life. Yes. But by loving me, He will make me acceptable. By loving me, by loving me, he will put his fire of the Holy Spirit into me and burn away 
the unquenchable fire it's not a threat of punishment it's an offer he will put fire into me make me his chul child and put fire of the holy spirit to burn away everything unacceptable and therefore we open our heart to him in the presence of our god here we are a lot of people we loved a lot of people we trusted a lot of people we counted on from every one of them at one time or other we felt rejected all those painful experiences are accumulated in our hearts therefore we have a fear a scare in every one of us i will be rejected again even by god i'm not good enough for my god i'm not good enough for my husband i'm not good enough for my wife the lord is telling you and me you are good enough for me hallelujah 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 hallelujah